This evening, it is my honor to welcome Patrick Aylett, Professor of American History at Emory University. Dr. Aylett received his undergraduate degree from Oxford University and the PhD in American History from Berkeley. He was director of the Emory University Center for Teaching and Curriculum from 2004 to 2009, where he studied ways to improve teaching and learning. During this time, he identified key elements to successful teaching and has compiled his insight in a series of courses for teachers. We are pleased to have Dr. Aylith with us this evening to discuss the crucial role educators play in the lives of our students and in the success of our society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Aylith. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks so much. It's a very great pleasure to be here tonight. We're, we're surrounded by education today, aren't we? Uh, everyone's talking about it. There's constantly stories in the newspapers about it. Your neighbors worry about it. You worry about it yourselves, both in your professional lives and in your life as, as parents. And it's so familiar to us that it's very easy to start thinking that there's something normal about it. But actually, we're living in a very, very, very strange set of circumstances. After all, throughout most of the history of the world, only a tiny minority of people have ever had any formal education at all. In most societies, it was just a little handful of the elite. And it was a handful of the boys only. And wherever you go, if you go back to medieval Europe or to the old civilizations of Asia and the Middle East and Africa, what you find everywhere is that education was always accompanied with a lot of flogging. The assumption seems to have been that learning is intrinsically so unpleasant that nobody will learn anything unless it's beaten into them. <laughs> now, as soon as you start thinking thoughts like that, you realize what an unusual situation we're in today. We take the view that everybody should be educated. We even have government policies with names like No Child Left Behind. Now, whatever you think about the policy, isn't it striking that it should have that title? that the nation's actually dedicating itself to the idea that everybody ought to be educated. And of course, it's just as much the girls as the boys. Isn't it the case now that the girls are doing better than the boys? Now, where I live in the state of Georgia, we don't have flogging anymore. And I'd be very surprised to hear that you had it in the state of Texas as well. All we're allowed to do is to raise our eyebrows and show a little sense of dissatisfaction at the students who haven't worked quite as hard as they might have done. But although, so although we're living in an unusual situation because of this idea of universal education for everyone, on the other hand, isn't it also true that we're doing something which has got familiar antecedents? What we're trying to do as teachers is to pass on to the students the entire heritage of our civilization. Every, every new generation is born with almost no knowledge at all, and so everything they're going to learn has got to come to them. First of all, it comes through their parents, and then once they're five or six years old, they're passed along to us. And we have to set about doing the very, very difficult and complicated work of teaching them how to read, how to write, how to navigate, how to build things. But in addition to those very practical and mechanical matters, we also have to teach them difficult moral lessons, how to develop self-restraint, how to develop qualities like patience and prudence and punctuality, a whole array of very, very difficult principles without which civilized life would be absolutely impossible. Now, we're living in a world which is becoming more specialized all the time. And that means, of course, that well, two things are happening. One is that the length of time during which ch students are being educated is tending to get longer. And we're, going, we're having to specialize more and more intensely because of the sheer difficulty of many of the tasks that the students themselves are learning to do. Now, the reality of our lives as teachers, probably yours and certainly mine, is that sometimes it's a little bit repetitive. Have you ever had that feeling? That, uh, and some days, of course, it doesn't go very well, does it? Sometimes, at the end of a day, you feel, well, oh, my teaching didn't really work out quite the way I'd hoped it would today. Or you find it's late at night, and you're grading an enormous set of student papers, 
and you find yourself a little bit unenthusiastic about reading the 27th one after you've read the first 26. And uh, at moments like that, it's very good, I think, to lift your head up and say to yourself, civilization depends upon me. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's very good indeed for your self-esteem. <laughs> now, there are lots of paradoxes associated with being teachers, and I'm going to tell you about some of these paradoxes, and I'm sure you've thought of them all, even if you haven't thought about them in exactly this way. The first is that we're asked to um, approach the world in an impossible way. We're asked to regard all the students as equal. And yet we know for a fact that they're not equal, don't we? Which of you ever goes into your classroom on the first day of the semester and looks out at all your students and says to yourself, by the end of the semester, they'll all have learned the same things and they'll all get the same grade on the exam? Yeah? You know that's not true, don't you? If you ever thought it, it certainly didn't last beyond the first two or three days of the first semester. And I'm sure you didn't think it then because you'd been in classes and you'd seen that there's an incredible variety of outcomes. Some people are just more talented than others. Some people have got far more durability and determination and doggedness to stick with it. Some have got an aptitude for the subject. There's an immense variety of, of qualities which they bring to the work, which is going to affect the outcomes. So now, I'm very struck by this because I'm English. When I was growing up in England, nobody ever talked about equality. The subject just never came up. I know that young Americans are constantly hearing from their families and from their teachers, we're all equal to one another. Nobody said that in Britain, especially not in my day. I was born in the mid-1950s, so I was a kid in the 60s. And in those days, Britain was a very hierarchical society. We had the, uh, the awareness that some people were our superiors and some people were our inferiors. And each one of us had our place on the ladder. We had certain responsibilities towards the people who were above us. And we had certain duties to the people who were below us. Now, when we went to school, it was absolutely clear that, that, that school was a zone of inequality. The teacher was in charge, and you, the student, were in a, in a, a subordinate position. Now, it's rather different in America, isn't it? Because here, everyone, everyone um, learns about equality. And, and in fact, I should say this, that one of the things that's so exciting for a foreigner like me to come to the United States is to discover how seriously people do take this idea. It's bracing, and it's exhilarating, and it's liberating. It's a wonderful idea, even though in practice it's very difficult indeed to live up to it. Incidentally, um, the whole history of the idea of equality is a fascinating thing. In the 1800s, after the American Revolution, Radicals throughout the rest of the world, especially in Europe, looked longingly towards America because they said the Americans have got what we want. They've got a one-man, one-vote democracy, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. What a fabulous place America is. And over the course of the 19th century, as slavery was abolished and as, as rights, well, eventually the, the right of women to vote and so on was introduced, this sense intensified. Now, at the same time, the European conservatives, the people who believed in hierarchy, said, this thing's never going to last. It won't last very long. Human equality is obviously not true, and it's going to be very, very unstable. But then a fabulous... I mean, history is always playing tricks on us, isn't it? A wonderful thing happened that throughout Europe in the 19th century, there were re repeated revolutions in France in 1830 and again in 1848 and again in 1870. But the Americans didn't keep having revolutions. It turned out, in fact, that this, uh, this democracy pledged to the idea of equality was more politically stable than the alternatives back in Europe. I think that's a lovely joke that history's played on everybody. Now, another paradox about being a teacher is that we're constantly working to make ourselves unnecessary. Isn't that true? <laughs> When you have a, a class of, of students, what do you do? You try to teach them so that they don't need you anymore. Yeah? At first, you understand that you're disciplined and they don't, but gradually you teach them until they don't need you anymore. In fact, isn't it true, really, that the only people who ever become fully educated are those who are self-educating? What we do as teachers is get them started along the road until they can take over on their own. So does that mean we're trying to put ourselves out of work? Not really, because luckily there are more kids coming up all the time. But uh, I love the, the, the way in which you, you can really feel most satisfied as a teacher when you can say, 
these kids don't need me anymore. I mean, in that sense, it's very comparable, isn't it, to being a parent, where when you send, I've just sent my child out into the world, she's 23, and on the one hand, my heart yearns for her, but on the other hand, I think, she can manage now. Yeah, she can manage, and I'm, I'm glad of it. All right, now here's another thing. Teachers are humble people, aren't they? Yeah. If, you look, <laughs> if you look around the world for humble people, teachers is a good place to start. And yet, the most important people in the entire history of the world were teachers. Think about Socrates, and Jesus, and Muhammad, and Confucius, and the Buddha. They were all teachers. If you read Plato's dialogues, what they do is they take you back more than 2,000 years to the marketplace in Athens, where Socrates is teaching. And at first you think, wow, it's so long ago, it's so far away, how can I possibly relate to something that's, that's remote in time and place? But almost at once, it becomes uncannily familiar. And you realize, it's just like a classroom. I understand it perfectly. Socrates throws out these questions, and the students give not very good answers. And Socrates says, well, I'm afraid that's not quite good enough. You've got to do better than that, and teases out the, the, the better answers from them and helps them in the process of self-discovery until they know themselves better. And as you read it, you think, oh, I understand that perfectly. In this sense, there's a wonderful continuity of our civilization all the way through these thousands of years. We even use the phrase, don't we, the Socratic method, a yeah, continuous line like that. Similarly with Jesus, quite apart from the religious aspects of his life, isn't it clear what a good teacher he was? That when he wanted to explain a complicated concept, he used parables, that is, familiar stories about the lives of the people around him, which they grasp easily. You know, he'd start them off with something simple and then move on to something more complicated. Think, for example, of the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus describes a man who's beaten up by robbers while he's on the road, and several people who really ought to help him pass by on the other side, anxious about being attacked as well. But then in the end, somebody does help him. And the man who gives him the help is a Samaritan. Now, when Jesus tells that story, he knows that his audience will understand at once the Samaritans are outcasts, and yet it's the outcast who helped. This is a wonderful way of responding to the question which someone's asked him, you know, who is my neighbor? To whom do I owe a moral responsibility? And the answer is you, you owe responsibility to all these people. Of course, one of the complications now for us teaching about Jesus is that he lived in rural Galilee. We don't live in rural Galilee, obviously. Most of us don't live by farming anymore. So sometimes we do have to do a little bit of translating. But it's still easy enough to get over that. One a very interesting person in American history, I think, in this context, is Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson wasn't really an orthodox Christian, but uh, he thought Jesus was a great teacher. And so what he did was he got his Bible, and he cut out of it, he, he, he cut the pages, and then he, he, in the Gospels he cut out the sections which referred to anything supernatural, the miracles. He didn't want those. And then what he did was to paste into a scrapbook everything that was left, basically Jesus' teaching. And he said, this is what I need. Now I've got what I needed to get from Jesus himself. So, you see, although most teachers don't have the opportunity to transform the conditions of, of civilization, these people do. And it's, it's very much the same with the Buddha and Muhammad and so on. Far more important than the great generals and the kings who very often seem to take pride of place in historical accounts. All right, now here's another of the paradoxes of being a teacher. Isn't it true that the good teachers are the ones who never stop learning? Yeah? You keep on reading, you keep on working in your own subject and finding out more about it. And with luck, if you have the time, you also learn a little bit about many of the other subjects as well. <clears throat> now, which of you has had this experience? You're reading, and you suddenly read a sentence, and it discloses to you an entire new realm of knowledge about which previously you knew nothing at all. Has that ever happened? Suddenly you think, I didn't even know this area of human endeavor existed. And yet now I do know about it. In other words, I'm more aware than ever before of how ignorant I am. Isn't this the case that, um, but isn't it also true that it's better to know that? It's better to know than not to know. I think that one, one thing that happens is that as you, ed, as you become educated, the, the, the sphere of your knowledge expands, but it opens up bigger and bigger horizons beyond your own knowledge of things about which you don't know. It's like setting out on a three-mile journey, and after the first mile, finding that there are still five miles to go. 
But nevertheless, it's a, better, it's a, it's a good thing to do. Let me give you one more, a, a lovely little anecdote, again from the life of Thomas Jefferson. During his lifetime, he only published one book. It was written in 1785, and it's called Notes on the State of Virginia. And it's a description of his home state, of which he was very proud. Now, at one point in that book, Jefferson says, if you go to the top of the Appalachian Mountains, they're about 5,000 feet high, but yet right up there at the top in the rocks, there are fossils. And they're fossils of sea creatures, uh, ammonites, shells. He says, how can that possibly be? Because if, if I mean, how can, how can fossils like that get to the top of the mountains? And Jefferson goes on to say, well, there are three theories about how they got there. The first theory is given to us by Voltaire, the French philosopher. He says, they look like sea creatures, but they're not really. They're really something else. The second theory is that during Noah's flood, which we know about from the book of Genesis, the waters covered the whole earth. And so this was the bottom of the sea for a while, and the sea creatures settled there and died, and eventually their bodies turned to stone. That's the second theory. And he says the third theory is that once upon a time, this really was the bottom of the sea, and later on, it rose up until it actually became a range of mountains. So then he takes the theories one by one, and he says, all right, Voltaire's theory, they're not really shells. Nope, that's wrong. They really are shells. He's absolutely convinced of that. Second one, Noah's flood. He says, now the problem with that is, if all the water in the world was in liquid state, in other words, if all the steam was, was condensed into water, and if all the ice was melted into water, it would still only raise sea level about 50 or 60 feet, nowhere near high enough to get to the top of the mountains. What about the theory? So that's wrong. So the first two are wrong. What about the theory that it was once the bed of the sea? He says, no, nope, that's wrong as well, because... If the bed of the sea rose up and became a range of mountains, people would notice. <laughs> and yet, nobody said a word about it. So that's wrong as well. And, in the end, and at the end of this passage, he has a lovely little thing where he says, we've got to admit we don't know. One day, one day people will know, but we don't know yet. We've got to admit that for the moment we're ignorant. But he says, it's better to be ignorant than wrong. And I think that's a wonderful little slogan for us as teachers, don't you? It's better to be ignorant than wrong. <laughs> Incidentally, of course, I, mean, we, I think, most think most people now, geologists certainly say, it really was the bed of the sea once. Because, of course, you see, what Jefferson didn't know is that, I mean, he lived in the 18th century. He was one of the most highly educated people in the 18th century. But in those days, even the most highly educated people assumed that the Earth was a few thousand years old. Only in the 1830s did Charles Lyell, uh, in geology, argue that the Earth's millions of years old and that there's time for things like this to happen and that they could have happened before there were any people around to, to talk about it. All right. Now... I wonder if you've all had the experience, I'm sure you have, of, of, of hearing lamentations about how bad American education is. This is something else we hear about all the time, isn't it? Oh, American education's terribly bad. It's in the newspapers all the time. It's on the TV. People worry about it constantly. Now, it is true that American education could be better, and I'm sure all of us think, well, they ought to do even more than I'm doing now. On the other hand, I do sometimes think that the lamentations are exaggerated. For example, we sometimes get comparisons. Have you ever seen those league tables about how everyone's doing in math? And America comes way down near the bottom, doesn't it? And the Koreans and Japanese are over. Well, remember that many societies specialize, and they specialize early. So that sometimes when you look at charts like this, you're getting a comparison of all the American kids against the best kids in the other countries doing these disciplines. I mean, again, I can give you an example from my own education, which makes this point very vividly. In my last two years in high school, that is the English equivalent of 11th and 12th grade, I only studied three subjects, history, English, and music. Last time I did math was when I was 15. I don't miss it at all. Yeah. <laughs> way, way back in 1972 was the last time I did any math. Right? And when I went to college, the only subject I studied was history. Yeah, every single college class I did was a history class. We specialized early. <laughs>
Now, of course, the benefit of that is that you study the one thing more deeply, but the drawback is that you don't know much about anything else, unless you're very enterprising and, and work hard on it. Let me tell you an anecdote. I bet you've never had anything happen like this to you. One of my college contemporaries, this is a guy who studied engineering at Oxford, when he was about 35, he said to me, you're a historian, aren't you? Tell me, was there an interval between the First World War and the second one? Yeah? He didn't know. He had no idea at all. And he didn't feel the least bit bothered about asking. <laughs> Now, I think that, that, you see, and there's hardly anybody in America with that degree of oblivion about history. <laughs> and it's because you've studied it. I mean, obviously, you don't learn this stuff. It doesn't come by osmosis. You have to learn it. And so educational systems which specialize early have got strengths, but they've got weaknesses as well. Now, one of the things which is so wonderful about the American educational system is its commitment to the idea of the liberal arts. This is something, this is a system, a, 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 a philosophy really, a belief that I was introduced to when I came to the United States. Here, when kids go to college, sometimes right up to the age of 20 and beyond, they're still studying mathematics, they're still doing sciences, they're still doing laboratory sciences, they're learning a foreign language, they're learning some of the social sciences, and so on. At Emory, where I work, you can't even graduate unless you can swim. Yeah? An incredible array of different activities and we tell them, this isn't so that you can earn more money. This is to make you a better citizen. It's to enrich your life. It does enrich their lives as well, and it makes it far more likely that they'll dedicate themselves to lifelong learning. I think it's a wonderful thing that the American universities are far more serious about, really, than anybody else. Um, now, I'm going to end with a challenging question. I'm going to ask you, do you think that teachers are paid too much? <laughs> do, you sometimes, do you sometimes wish, I wish my paycheck really had a little bit less in it? <laughs> All right. To ask that question is to answer it, isn't it? In the negative. Yeah. It's easy, isn't it, as a teacher? It's easy to feel underappreciated, I think. But then, of course, you have to reflect upon just what an incredibly worthwhile job you're doing. All of us went into teaching for vocational reasons. Nobody leaving college thought, I'm interested in the big money, so teaching's the job for me. <laughs> the place where I work, Emory, um, it's a very, very rich private school. And most of our students want to go into medicine or law or business. Those are really the three big things that Emory graduates go on to. And sometimes the students whom I'm advising come to me and say, hey, Dr. Allo, do you think I'd make a good lawyer? And depending on what I think of them, I quite often say, no, I think you make a terrible lawyer. Uh, I say, why don't you become a teacher instead? Especially ones I like the most. And they look at me with a, a mixture of pity and... <laughs> <laughs> pity and contempt. <laughs> and say, a teacher? Like, Ugh. Ugh. And, I, I, and I say to them, listen, listen. Isn't it true that however much money you make, you're always going to want more? You've got to put aside things like that. Yeah. Think about what lawyers do. Lawyers are always working with people who are in conflict with each other. People go to law when they can't sort out their problems with each other. It brings out the worst in everybody. Your working life will be spent among people who are argumentative and bloody-minded and difficult and cantankerous. Don't do that. And then sometimes, of course, the students come to me and say, Doctor, uh, Dr. Riley, do you think I'd make a good doctor? And I say, well, you might, yes, you might. But, you know, the problem with doctors is that they're always dealing with sick people. <laughs> now, I'm very glad there are doctors, especially when I'm sick. But nevertheless, it's true, isn't it? Doctors deal with sick people, and there's only two possible outcomes. Either the patient gets better or the patient dies. And, and in either case, you, the doctor, lose contact with them. <laughs> It's, it's much better to be a teacher, much better. Because if you're a teacher, you spend your life with people who are young and healthy and enthusiastic, and they're full of goodwill, they're optimistic, they haven't yet had all the hope beaten out of them by hard, hard circumstances. They're lovely people to be around on the whole. <laughs>
Yeah, that's a much, much better way of life than doing it. And I say to these students, I'm serious, even though I, I say it jokingly, I'm serious, I'd be a teacher. Because, you know what the teachers are? They're the guardians of civilization. Thanks very much indeed. Thank <laughs> you.